uh, in itself. There are better examples uh, that people have used experimentally. This one is commonly chosen because it works well in an audience. Uh, but I'd recommend looking at some of the experimental paradigms that have actually uh, have, have, have explored these kinds of questions, because it's obviously not just with lorry drivers that people have looked at uh, uh, these kinds of re reasoning questions. Okay, thanks. So just to clarify the stereotypical features of NUS professor, you know, not all of us wear spectators spectators or, or would be considered as slim, huh? I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> clearly not, clearly not. So we have outliers. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm not seeing or not hearing yet. you, Brian. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we have a question from the back. Uh, Professor, you mentioned point four. Our brains are often lazy. Mm -hmm. Do you mean that we are not working the brain enough, or the brain naturally reverts to laziness? I'd say more the, I think it's a bit of both, but the examples in this case are more uh, that the brain is taking shortcuts. So we talked about some of this actually, uh, 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 Steve talked about some of this before, in that uh, there are a lot of pressures on the brain to do things quickly, to do things efficiently. And it's not particularly quick or efficient to go through a Bayesian calculation every time you want to come up with an answer. So that's one reason we might have, say, a heuristic or just jump to a conclusion. Uh, as far as not putting in the effort, that strikes me as a slightly different issue. But what I'm advising people to do is that because we make these fundamental errors kind of naturally, or when we're being lazy, or when you're just kind of going with our gut instinct, that means in a lot of these cases, it's worth putting in the effort to get the right answer, to get a better answer at least. Sorry, sorry. Uh, the, br the human brain, right, somehow is like, uh, it's like conditioned behavior, you know. Somehow we just conditioned to behave in old ways. Not that it's mental shortcut, it's just repetitive behavior. I mean, a, a, lot of rep a lot of shortcuts are indeed repetitive behavior. Now, where that comes from, whether that is conditioned, whether it's just something we have innate, uh, I can't say in this case. Probably a mix of both. Okay, thank you very much. What about one final question? <laughs> yes. Hi, thanks for this uh, very illuminating uh, presentation. I would like to ask you uh, what has been some of the practical applications of your work in terms of um, professions. Um, let's say if you were a, if somebody were a teacher, you know, uh, and in areas of uh, attention deficit dis disorder, mm -hmm. or in another field, you know, somebody uh, works in the is a financial banker, and then uh, they are not they don't usually make decisions very well at 11 p.m. at night. Right. What are some of the views? Yeah. So the right, the, the right person to talk to about the decision making with sleep deprivation is either uh, the person I work for, who is uh, Mike Chi, or you can ask uh, O'Daniel Daniel Gilman, who is probably here somewhere. Um, those are the better people to ask about, specifically about applications of decision making and, and sleep deprivation. But let me just say that uh, the, the implication is fairly clear. If you have working memory problems, it's going to be a lot harder for your brain to hold in mind the various pieces of information that are actually needed to make good decisions. That's the very fundamental kind of basic level problem of sleep deprivation. Um, what would be, of course, useful then is to take that, that basic idea and then see in a situation, in a teaching situation, in a financial situation, something like that, what are the, the real effects. I haven't studied that myself, but other people will. Perhaps some of you will. Okay, in view of time, which uh, taxi drivers are very focused on, uh, <laughs> apologize, we have to move on. Uh, let us thank uh, Chris for the wonderful talk once again. Okay, it's, it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Guan Chun Tai. Uh, like most of us who work in boring department of this, department of that, uh, Chun Tai actually works in a very cool place called I Squared R which stands for um, Institute for Infocom Research under ASTAR. Now, Chun Tai is the principal research scientist at the i r and he's also the department head of the Neuro and Biomedical Technology. Chun Tai, uh, you know, as uh, many of you know, he's actually the, ex the resident expert in brain-computer interface. 
and I know his lab uh, does a lot of cool stuff, including using BCI to help patients recover functionally from stroke, and also helping children with uh, attention deficit uh, disorder. So please put our hands together to welcome Chun Tai to talk about bench and bedside applications of BCI. Um, actually, um, I don't know whether you, all of you got a chance to see this, but upstairs there's a poster session area that we've had um, where students from the high school all the way up to the graduate level and research level have been presenting their work. And over the last one and a half days, they've been judged by a panel of professors and students. And so I'm going to pass it over to Shini in the committee uh, to introduce the winners. Hi, so um, can we invite Prof. Wise up to give out the certificates to the winners? Prof. Wise, please. So for the poster session, in second runner-up, we have Music Therapy for Patients with Dementia, Current Insights by Sanjeev Nair. In first runner-up, we have Exploring the Effect of Positive and Negative Feedback on the Motor Imagery-Based Brain-Computer Interface by Chung Chang. And the best poster for the conference goes to Pre-existing Brain States Predicts Choice Between Gamble and Certainty by Ivan Huang and Professor Po Zhang here. Thank you, Prof. Weiss. Um, we have come to the end of the Games, Entertainment and Other Applications session.